So you can see I have a I have a slider for gain, and I have a slider for the frequency of my single tone. So here I'm moving around from various various frequencies. I'll stick with 400 megahertz. I can look at the time domain, and then I can look at the compression graph. This compression graph is simply a model of what I I uh, showed you before. So here I'm in white. I have my perfectly linear amplifier, and in red is the actual response of this system. So first, let's look at the time domain. So think about this. I'm going to apply my nonlinearity. Uh, you're not going to see it yet because my gain's really low. But so suppose I, I put this particular sinusoid into a nonlinear amplifier. What happens is some portions of the signal get amplified more than others. So for example, this portion right here, around zero volts, is very small in gain. And the, the amplifier will address that almost perfectly. However, the peaks and valleys of that signal become squished as my amplifier is, gets driven into compression. So what I'm going to do is increase the gain. And I have this normalized, so you won't necessarily see the gain increase. But what you will see is that as my gain approaches a higher value, the shape of this signal becomes distorted. Now you can see at 10, you see something of a soft clipping where it basically it just looks like you've squished the sinusoid. And you can see that these, these peaks and valleys are more rounded than they should appear. So that's what it looks like in the time domain. But in the frequency domain, that squishing or distortion creates harmonics. So now, in the frequency domain, as I increase my gain, you can see that the, the signal-to-noise, or the spurious free dynamic range, gets reduced. In other words, at low gain, my harmonics are almost invisible. But as I increase my gain, the, the, the amplitude difference between my fundamental and my harmonics is very small. So here you can see at about 5 dB of gain, uh, my closest harmonic is maybe 40 d 45, 50 dB away, which can be problematic. So we all understand the concept of, of harmonics and linearity in that respect. This is common with DACs, ADCs, uh, and, and other components that we're familiar with. But the challenge with this type of distortion is that it's particularly problematic with communication signals. And the reason why is because you're no longer dealing with a single peak, but you're dealing with a signal that covers a range of frequencies. For that reason, a common measurement that's made is called intermodulation distortion. So what I'm going to do is go back to my uh, remove my gain, and I'll click on the intermod tab. OK. Now to make an intermod distortion uh, measurement, or to read or to understand an intermod distortion specification, what you do is you generate two sinusoids at very close frequencies. Now the reason why is because when I add my, my nonlinearity, you can see the harmonics are added in a way that we might not expect. So first we can look. Our first frequency is, say, at, at 500 megahertz, and our second one is at 600, right? And so the second order harmonic of a 500 megahertz tone will appear right here at 1.2 gigahertz. That makes sense. I'm oh, sorry, this is the, five, the 1 gigahertz one. I'll back this down just a little bit so it's more accurate. All right? And then our second tone is around 600 megahertz. So the second harmonic should be at 1.2 gigahertz. So if we look at this tone right here, the second harmonic should be at 1.2 gigahertz, right? So this is a second order distortion product and another second order distortion product. However, when you're generating a two-tone signal, an additional harmonic appears at both the sum and the difference of the two fundamental tones as well. So what that does is it adds an additional harmonic right in here. So see, at 1.1 gigahertz, we have a, a third second-order distortion product at F1 F plus F2, which is 1.1 gigahertz. Now that's not terrible yet, because these harmonics are fairly far from the signal of interest. The problem occurs in the third order distortion products. If I have a signal at 1 gigahertz and a signal at 600 megahertz, those two signals together will produce an additional third order distortion product at the sum and the difference of those frequencies. So let's do some math. So 600 megahertz, uh, or 1 gigahertz minus 600 megahertz is 400 megahertz. And that produces this harmonic right here. Holy crap! All of a sudden, our third-order distortion products are very, very close to the signal of interest, and they can't be filtered out. That's why th third-order uh, uh, harmonics are problematic with modulated signals. So we'll do, we'll do that exercise again. So here I see another one. I have another harmonic at 1.2 gigahertz. This is a second-order product. 
right? If I mix 1.2 gigahertz with 600 megahertz, what's the sum? What's the difference of those two? Well, that's 600 megahertz, so that's not that's not terrible. If I mix 1.2 gigahertz with 500 megahertz, what's the difference of those? It's 700 megahertz, and that's that third order product is right here. So what we're seeing is, while second order distortion products can be filtered out, third order distortion products with modulated or two tone signals occur in the band of interest and they can't be filtered. Now that's interesting enough as it is. You'll see, actually, as I increase the gain of my signal, those distortion products increase by even more. So at low gain, I'll say negative 0.01, uh, the distortion products aren't even visible. As I increase by, by a factor of 10, you see, start to see them popping up and popping up even more. And so the relationship I want to point out here is that the distortion products increase more, uh, increase as a function of the signal gain, but they increase by more as a signal gain. In fact, the, the, the ratio is that for every 1 dB increase in my fundamental tones, my third order distortion products actually increase by 3 dB. So let's think about that real quick. So suppose I have a signal, let's see here, at negative 0.01, my gain is, my peak to peak is at about negative 20 dBm. You can see my third order distortion products here at maybe negative 120. Now in this particular case, a measurement that I would make is called intermod distortion. And if I were to specify intermod distortion of this signal, I would say my distortion is the delta between these two bars, and that is 97 dB at an amplitude of negative 23. So to specify intermod distortion, it's this amplitude right here at this particular level. Obviously, as I increase my gain, my intermod distortion uh, uh, changes. So what I'm going to do is investigate that relationship. Suppose I put my peak at negative 20 dBm. You can see my distortion at negative maybe 110. So if I'm correct, if I increase my fundamental tones by 10 dB, my third order distortion products should also increase by how much? 30 dB, three times. So what I'm going to do is move this red bar to be 10 dB higher at negative 10. And what I'm going to do is move the yellow bar 30, bar 30 dB higher to negative 80. Now, when I increase my signal gain, the fundamental tones should eclipse this red bar at the exact same time as these third order distortion products uh, eclipse the yellow bar. So I'm going to increase the gain, and you can see that right there. Yeah, it's a little bit off. There we go. So it's 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 pretty close. Let's see if I can go down. So now here we here we see our our fundamental tones at negative 10, and the third order distortion products at negative 80. So if I were to specify intermod distortion for this particular signal, I would say my intermod distortion is 70 dBm 70 dB at negative 10 dBm. Now obviously that specification requires two particular numbers. One way to combine those two numbers into a single measurement is a related measurement called third order intercept. And what that is, is I continue to increase my signal gain. At some theoretical point, my distortion will actually eclipse the fundamental signal. That level is called the third order intercept. Now the reality is the third order intercept occurs beyond the saturation of the amplifier. So you never actually can generate a signal at that level. But in this particular case, I can see uh, at, at some point, uh, my model actually breaks down at a certain level. But you can see that if I start really, really low, the distortion products are really small. They're catching up, they're catching up, they're catching up. At some point, those distortion products eclipse the fundamental. And so the way we figure that out is that we, we set our signal to a certain level, we measure the distor distortion, and then we add that level. So we'll, we'll, do, that, we'll do that at 0 dBm. So if my fundamental is at 0 dBm, I'll move the red line there, move the yellow line to the third order distortion products, negative 65. And so here, my, uh, my delta Y is, uh, or, or my IM3 measurement is 55 dB. If I were to increase my fundamental by 27.5 dB, the, th the, the fundamental and the distortion would be equal. So in this particular environment, my third order intercept is exactly 0 plus uh, 27.5 dB.